is my I'm his nephew. My name is uh, Amanda Ora. His mother, Hajia Zulehat Musa, is my grandmother. Her first child was my father. Her last child was Muhammad Buhari. My father was his guardian, but it was tough for him, but tough for us also. Life was very tough in those days. You went to school in the morning, you came back and you go to the bush, collect firewood for the night reading. We had no lamps in those days. We used firewood to light, uh, and we had slates, which we wrote chapters of the Quran and, uh, and read. And so you, you have one chapter, you read it uh, during the session, and then Tomorrow morning you wash it, and another chapter or a piece thereof is written, and you, you learn it by heart. So when I was away from home, I think uh, I was constrained to behave myself because there was nobody to, to rescue me. So I was behaving myself. As I said, I became a, a class monitor, I, I, I became a junior prefect, I became a senior prefect, I became a head boy. You know, boys will be boys. Uh, you will transgress uh, on occasions. You will be late for school, uh, refuse to attend uh, lessons sometime, go, go out to play, and that, that will be severely punished. Whoever did that will, will be punished. And uh, the teachers were, I wouldn't say harsh, but they were disciplined. They taught us discipline. If you transgress, grass, they lash you. There was discipline in schools law then. There was there's corporal punishment. And I think, to a certain extent, it molded the minds of the children and so on and so forth. Um, we were, our generation was very lucky. Our teachers were absolutely committed and dedicated. Mm. And they treated us, or they treated us like their own children. Mm. If you do well, you are praised. You are brought before the classroom. You are what you are shown and you are praised. If you don't uh, perform, you are again brought before the class, yes. stripped and plugged on the, on the buttocks. And uh, there is no way I can forget um, school because what we call the, the teacher I see there, called Mala Abdul, is a very strict person. And, um, um, he doesn't spare the rod. Mm-hmm. We call it Bulala. Really. Um, we don't like the rainy season approaching because we have to go to school farm. You wouldn't be late there, just like a classroom. And if you are late uh, from 6 to, f- to 2, Bulala on your buttocks. And you have to remove your uh, shorts so that uh, you get to the message proper. Um, among the teachers, I could only again remember our Arabic teacher. No matter how hot it is, he comes in with a bad, with a turban. And uh, every week we are given to the side part of the Quran. Yeah. Every week. And uh, the only thing we can do is to avoid it is to report sick if we haven't recited the, the part given that week. And so we report sick. But even if you report sick, then you are stopped from going to a breakfast break until you recite the bath you are given in the class. Hmm. I'm so, you didn't get too much, Bilala, because you are always like a leader in class. You will be very surprised. I got a lot because um, I tried to avoid going to the school farm 
And uh, if you miss it, you are not allowed to go on breakfast break. So you will, uh, you will have no break until the school is closed. But what uh, I do between the first whistle and the last one, I go over the wall of the school, rush to home, and sometimes I'm eating up to the time I'm going to the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, no one could forget those days. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be clever by half. <laughs> How did a boy from Daura end up in Liverpool, straight out of secondary school? I was picked from here. And then the whole of the north, again, I was the only person picked to go to UK, recommended to go to UK, Elder Dumpster. And then uh, uh, some slots for children from each region, from the north, from the west, from the east, then, and from Lagos. Four of us were taken. And uh, that's how I, how I managed. You can see the system then. Here in, the, in Katuna province, we are the junior part. Uh, in Daura here, but I was picked you know, from the whole of the north to go to UK for holidays. That's when my father went to the UK. And um, what struck me when we arrived at Liverpool, we went to the center of the Liverpool. Some of the cities in London, then there was a, a central roundabout in the town. From there, you can go to other places. And uh, when we went down about break time, I saw people coming out. Everybody well dressed up, you know, just the way you are, but uh, almost three piece. Um, handsome, healthy. And then I reflected a street back here in Katana on my school days. When I'm going to the mosque on Fridays, blind men, cripples, leopards, mm -hmm. People in rags begging for what to eat. So I say, God, how can we understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That impression is still there in me. Look at people coming out as if they made it up themselves. Very well dressed and something. Under development is terrible. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can say. He was interested in science at the time. He was thinking of becoming a doctor. You know, he was born in 1942, you know, sort of the end of colonial era in, in Nigeria. They, they didn't really have a medical school yet at, uh, at ABU. It turned out not to be a career path for him, although it was an interest. When he was finishing up secondary school, uh, the emir of Katsina, who was the neighboring emir to Daura, was encouraging young you know, men from the north with leadership potential to go into the to the officers' training. The Emir of Kaduna then, he sent Hassan. It was no longer a profession for the poor. My height was a disadvantage to me. He was, then there were cadets only in government colleges. Zaria, KP, in the north. I don't know how many in this house. The provincial secondary school, which was my school, they are, they are not given uh, army cadets. But the Emir of Kaduna want to make a case to Lady Sardona that he wanted a cadet school, a cadet in, 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 in his secondary school in, in the state. So the Sardona told the prime minister, and the prime minister told the minister of defense. And then Kaduna had a cadet, and then, um, a retired oh, ex-World War II veteran from Katana was made uh, to be in charge of the trainer. Just because of my height or something, I was picked to be the, the sergeant. So from there, I was impressed by the military discipline and so on. So when I left, I just went straight to, to, to the army. And he was very attracted with the idea of uniform, uh, discipline, and uh, extracurricular activities like uh, night uh, exercise and the drills 
that attracted him very much, and he was eventually, eventually. Plus, he had a few friends like Sheikh uh, Eradua. May God uh, have mercy on him, and uh, Jega Emir of Gondu, and Magoro. Um, they were his classmates, and they all started. So that the hard instinct also had an influence in his decision to join the army. And he has never regretted it since. It must have been something for him. I mean, he went into the army to be a soldier. Then there was a political crisis, the coup and the counter coup, then the civil war. This is where the, the value of fighting for country comes in, because at every point of his military training, he was taught, you know, you fight for your country, you die for your country, uh, and you do it with honor. Uh, and so the idea of splitting the country was, it just sent shockwaves through these people, it was, even though they knew some of these counterpart officers on the other side. They never saw it as a, Buhari never saw it as, a, as an Igbo thing, as an ethnic thing. He always saw it as the rebels and the, and the attempt to, to split the country. His battalion, the second battalion, Nigerian army, he was number two in the battalion. They were the first to fire shots. A battle in which they were advancing and the, the opponents, the rebels, uh, shot at them. And the fellow on his right was killed, the fellow on his left was killed. But he, he was unscathed. It was dreadful, dreadful. I, I was so afraid reading the dispatches to see the uh, casualties. And I always poured over the casualty to see if his name was, was involved. The Biafran Civil War was one where you didn't know you, you were going to survive. They were hacking their way through the, uh, through the rainforest, and, and, which was very different than the dry savanna in, in the north. And his men had to uh, be sure to uh, take health precautions, uh, change their socks, not, not get fungus in their feet and uh, things. So, he, he was always concerned with the welfare of his men. Uh, I, I think even his critics would, would say this, that this was a, a young officer who took his leadership seriously. And if I tell you that I walked across Nigeria from Ben State, virtually up to the sea, when we were fighting the sea below, the 30 months receiving war, I was always in the front, within the small arms range for the 30 months. I was never relieved. But when I was sent to India and the United States subsequently to do my training, people were saying, why are you in Buhari? But when I was being sentenced to the front, nobody asked, why didn't they bring me back to their headquarters where they have time to drink and dance? This is Nigeria. <laughs> there was a bloodless coup today in Nigeria, which is black Africa's biggest and richest nation and the world's eighth largest oil producer. The overthrow of strongman Major General Yakabu Gowan. Hello, Nigerians. Events of the past few years have indicated that despite our great human and material resources. So I had you met the then Colin Buhari when he was governor of the Northeast. Way back in the early 70s or mid 70s, I was a young student aged about 18, 19, and he was then governor of the Northeast. He was military governor of the Northeast and I was a young student activist as the secretary general of the students union in the then Northeast College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, when Mutala was killed, I led a delegation of students uh, to protest the, uh, the killing of Mutala, demanding that the coup plotters uh, be brought to book uh, and be tried. Well, he was quite a very 
serious looking military officer. And my impression of him was that he was somebody that was uh, destined for the future uh, to become an effective leader in this country. General Shehu Eradua, may, may God bless him, may Allah have mercy on him, told me how Buhari was made Minister of uh, Petroleum in Obasanjo's uh, government. They set the, the group who were naming ministers and governors and so on, and they said, who is the most honest <laughs> and the most serious among the officers of the Nigerian army? the one with the most integrity, and they, they honed in on Buhari. So they appointed him Minister of Petroleum, and uh, they all thought he would not get his hands dirty with <laughs> oil money. Indiscipline, corruption, squandered mania, misuse and abuse of public office for self or group aggrandizement, which had assumed debilitating proportions in the last few years, will be dealt with ruthlessly, no matter whoever may be involved. It wasn't easy in the sense that um, I noticed a lot of things were going wrong, personally. Uh, People were looking for office just to be materially endowed or empowered. I thought it was wrong. I think leadership is a sacrifice. It was clear to the senior officers, including Bahari, that the junior officers were going to do something if they didn't. And the junior officers were taking their cue from next door in Ghana where Jerry Rawlings had just taken over, a young flight lieutenant in the Air Force, uh, and, and, and lined up and shot the previous senior military people who had been ruling the country. So the, the senior military people in Nigeria thought, we'd better stabilize the situation. Uh, we, we don't want another you know, Jerry Rawlings situation here. Buhari was not terribly keen he wasn't terribly keen about it, but there was nobody to lead the nobody to lead the change of government. Nobody with the credibility and the integrity to uh, you know to convince the country that a change was necessary. It wasn't his uh, his, 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 his 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 choice. He needs to emphasize self discipline and leadership by good. Example, begin by drawing public attention to little but important everyday manifestations of indiscipline, such as... Yeah, try to impose discipline on the country. So it, it was a kind of a culture clash between military culture and the Nigerian uh, grassroots culture, if I may say. The night of the coup, you were with him, right? I was in Lagos and um, we had dinner and then we talked until about 11 or 11 p.m. Then I went back to my digs. We, we had no idea, no inkling, whatever, something was afoot. In the morning, one staff came and told me, look, there has been a change of government. Your uncle has been deposed. The coups in Nigeria have a history of being very violent and very bloody. So I pray to God that they don't kill him or injure him or 
something, uh, something of that nature. The people who know him well said he was aware, but the only way he could have prevented it was to execute, you know, uh, six or eight of the senior officers, and he wasn't willing to do this. I think he prevented a, a, a more serious situation because when you start killing officers, uh, you know, who knows where it's going to lead. Now he's down in, in Benin, he's under house arrest. He's living in a cottage uh, with guards. He, he figured that if, if Bob and Gita wanted to kill him, he would be dead by now. So uh, it was uh, uh, really a question of just marking time and, and, and using it to, to realize, well, this is the end of his military career and it was uh, possible for people to visit him, but only with the permission of General Mabandida, who is now in charge. He was detained for three and a half years. I went to see him regularly every month uh, in Akure and in Benin. Uh, very restrictive and uh, it's very boring. And uh, he didn't know what eventually the government would do. Uh, with him, and he was only released on the death of his mother. But throughout, I think his spirit never for a moment broke because so many people gave me messages to tell him to say, please write to Babangida and tell him, since he has taken over, let him go. He said, no, I will not. never, never write to him. I'll never talk to him. His uh, spirit never broke throughout the three and a half years. Even though Jonathan Abacha was part of the, the military elite that uh, toppled his government, uh, out of patriotism, you know, to save the government, he accepted to serve as the chair against the advice of uh, many of his uh, close associations. He said, no, it is not about Abacha, it is not about uh, toppling of the government, it is about the country. We need to save this country. We need the, the, the infrastructure has decayed. So he accepted as the chairman. And uh, quickly he assembled uh, some uh, professionals, largely young men, and, uh, and, and we went into work. If you go down even to our hospitals to check, we see, if you see linens that are curtains, you know, shielding the beds, besides the few procurements, you will see PTF inscribed. If you see the roads today and you go through from north to south, there hasn't been any corner you will go through without seeing the project of the PTF. If you see hospitals with equipments, basically, even in the theaters today, you will see that you will have the little, you know, inscription of the PTF. Nearly every week, some delegation from different parts of Nigeria were coming to see us in Kaduna, saying, look, you have to come and take care of the, uh, have to come and lead this government. We're drifting. We're going back to the 1983 uh, period. And he resisted this for a long time until both political parties sent emissaries to tell him that if he wanted, they would give him the ticket to run for the presidency. He succumbed to the pressure. On, on Thursday, 26th of April, 2002, we went to Daura, where he registered as a Kadkare member of the then APP, uh, which is the second largest party uh, after PDP at that time. I think it was 1,100,000 uh, 
I received a phone call and they said I should help them look for a vice presidential candidate. That's Christian and from the South. We couldn't make any headway and we decided to lay to lay it down. Until January 15 at 12 noon, I received a phone call from the general. He said, I'd prayed my own way and I want you to pray. I would like you to be my running mate. My first response was, thanks, but no thanks, sir, because I'm heading a group, and I've given them my word that I will neither join partisan politics or seek an elective office. But even within the group, they said, you have been positioning us for days. We are now saying, you must take this. Long story short, sure, by the time I called, uh, Pastor Adeboye called everyone, contacted this and that, the rest is history. Uh, I had to team up with him to become his running mate. And it was such an experience that I cannot forget. Character, credibility, competence, integrity, those are the issues. And by the grace of God, 2011, we will have a new president. All the three elections were rigged, massively rigged. Let me give you an example. 2007, uh, after our lawyer made his uh, submission to the Supreme Court, I went to his office and I asked for the uh, results of just one of the states. He gave me results of Imo states. Imo states. I went over the, the carefully over the results, and then they just say PDP. That's Omar Eradua, twenty-five thousand. Buhari, five thousand. Round figures throughout. Round figures. The winner of the election, Omar Eradua himself, said the elections were faulty. If you recall. After you, you know you won in 20, 2003, rigged. You know you won in 2007, rigged. You know you won in 2011, changed, rigged. What will, what will you do? Spain is the third and last one for me. Since after it, I will not present myself again for election into the office of the president. So he just, he didn't break down in tears, he just uh, broke down in uh, pity for the system, for the country, and he said, I'll never do it again, never do it again. So when this thing happened in 2011, it was worse than what had happened in 20 and 2007. It was, it was worse than what had happened in 20, uh, 2003. So it is this thing, it is not the bitterness that he lost that worried him. And then he said, well, it, it will appear now uh, nothing is going to change this thing. It's like, well, it's a country of over 150 million. Uh, I have tried my best. I have made my own contribution. And my contribution uh, is not recognized. And surely it's better to keep off from this. This is his eldest daughter, Magadia. She suffered all her life uh, with sickle cell disease. And then uh, a confluence of events 
a few uh, days with, with the announcement, she also died. So that, uh, that shook him very much. But I would say that he, the death of his daughter shook him more than the, the loss of the election. There is what they call sickle cell anemia. Um, uh, there are people who are SA, there are people who are SS. So I think when the developed countries found about this uh, sickle cell uh, disease, um, they tried to stop marriage between AS or SS so that they don't have this sickle cell anemia. My first wife, my late first wife, um, unfortunately, I think she is SA or AS and I'm AS. So my, my two children, my first daughter and my first son, happen to be SSS and they died of it. It was hard, but uh, when I gave to my second wife, uh, I asked who introduced her to me that she must be AA. So that if my, if my child picked the S from B, she could only pick S from her, A from her. So AS is not normally susceptible to, uh, to the anemia. So in 2013-2014, you decided to team up with the other opposition parties. How did that come about? The PDP. We are so confident that nobody could remove them. And I think they, they just ignored even being careful. So we persuaded the other parties the CPC, Congress for Progressive Change, which I was leading, the ACN from Southwest mostly, Abga from Southeast geopolitical zone. I said, and, until we came together, there was no way we could remove PDP. I persuaded them, they agreed, Aswaju, uh, Tinivu, from the North, uh, from, well, from CPC, this was myself, and then from the South East, Abga, Rocha, Okorocha. So I, I we got people from uh, various parties to come together. Now you had a strong opposition party, but you almost got killed before the election. I think uh, Konkwasu was very generous. He gave me an armored uh, vehicle, uh, a Land Rover. Uh, he said I should be using it because uh, he believed that uh, the competition I am about to, well, I am going on, I think there are people who really wouldn't like to to compete with me. They would like to eliminate me. I said, okay. So I had um, to go to Kano, and I somehow I, I was using that uh, jeep. And uh, a vehicle near the secretary, federal secretary in Kaduna, wanted to overtake us. My escort stopped them. But... Uh, before we go on the, that overhead bridge, which was parallel to our filling station on the right as you are leaving Kaduna for Zalia, they just blew the thing. And when I looked, I saw the pieces of human beings. People who were, who were being blasted by the bomb. The chap who we were traveling with in the car, on my left was thrown on my left because the uh, the bag, you know, the, the, the crash bag, which is the vehicle have some of them, uh, the one on my side was blown. 
The one on his side, I think, uh, was not blown, so he was thrown on my lap. And when I looked, I saw blood on my trousers and on my gown. But none of us, the two people in the vehicle and two of us behind, four of us, none of us were injured. But somehow I saw blood because of the number of people killed outside and by the blood of the bomb. And uh, I came out, I was concerned with the dead people, but uh, some people stopped a vehicle, pushed me inside and drove me home. And that was the end of it. This is how efficient the Nigerian security agents are up to today. It is now my pleasure to hand over the certificate of return as prepared by the National Convention Planning Committee to the winner of the All Progressives Congress presidential primary, General Muhammad Buhari retired. Page and we went around in buses a lot, you know. We traveled from state to state, you know. And I recall in particular, we were at a, I think it was in Zamfara, where we saw these young people, and this always happened, of course, pressing themselves against the window of the bus that went to land, you know, shouting, say, Baba, you know, Baba, or you, you, and all of that. And he said, Look at the faces of these young people. He says, the expectations are high, very, very high. He says, and they expect us to do magic the moment we get into office, you know. Look at all of them. Here in Kaduna, we voted for General Muhammad Wari, not because he's an ordinary or a Muslim, but because we believe he's going to bring change, he's going to stop the insecurity, the, corrupt, uh, the corruption, and the callousness and the impunity. that Muhammad Bumari of APC, having satisfied the requirements of the law and scored the highest number of votes, is hereby declared the winner and is in turn elected. solemnly swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and that I will preserve... Well, don't forget that I tried three times. 2003, I think 2007, and 2011. And I ended up in Supreme Court three times. The first time I went to address the pressmen and some Nigerians that are, were very curious, I was expecting sympathy, but the group laughed at me. So I said, okay, good day. And God sent technology. With permanent voters card, PVC, it's very difficult, you know, to do what uh, Fulton used to do in Nigeria. Well, some of us will claim credit to the fact that we, we, we are popular, but key is the character of our candidate. First, his character was, was essential to salvage the country. The country was in so much crisis, financially, security-wise, in every ramification. This is the victory that is completely due to the support of the people. The normal elites, those who normally decide things, were all against this movement, and it came to victory. And I knew the country needed Buhari, and it has got it now. It is one of the best moments in my life. I didn't know I was going to be part of the government, but the fact that Buhari has won, 
was just enough for me as a cause for happiness for this nation. I, I remember that very, very day when the, the uh, announcement was made. He, 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 from his office in Lobito upstairs, he came down to my office. And I look at him, you know, in the very, he was looking in the ceiling in very pensive mood. After some one or two minutes, I said, sir, I would not like to congratulate you. I would rather pity you. He said, thank you. Thank you. So he went out, back to his office. He is a man of uh, inflexible integrity. He's also a very simple man, a very religious man, and also dedicated to Nigeria. If he has political views, is that Nigeria together is, is, is the best for all the peoples. He's a man of his words, he's a man of honor, he's a man of courage, is a man of uprightness. He's a nonsense man. He has never, for once that I know him, done anything that will advance his selfish interest, either for himself as a person, for friends, for family. He believes in the ultimate goodness of each and every Nigerian including those of us who work with him. Yes, he will discuss challenges with you, but ultimately he always believes that, he, that you will do the right thing. Muhammad Buhari, he listens a lot. Uh, he is not too much in a hurry to take decisions, and uh, he is also very considerate. He said, Nigeria is a very complex place. You need to take measured decisions because every decision you take with the impact on the lives of people. So, but he is a very, very thorough leader. Uh, there are so many adjectives you can use to describe Buhari, but truly, he is a leader whose time had, has come and uh, he has led this country very, very well. Under no circumstances, the leader will probably be sending his people or be asking you to do this for him. Buhari has never sent anybody to me in the last seven years to do anything for him or for the person. I have had the privilege of serving seven Nigerian presidents in my public career. And the styles of leadership are different, the circumstances are different, but as a boss, he supports, he gives you the resources to do your work. You can say anything about uh, him or his policies, but nobody doubts his integrity and his commitment to ensure uh, that public resources are, are very well managed uh, and that, that he cares about uh, all parts of the country, including those that may not have voted for him conspicuously, not voted for him uh, in several elections that uh, he has undergone in this country. His driver took me from his house to go to Governor Erufai's house. And when we got to Erufai's house in Kaduna, his driver said, Daddy, who was referring to me, I'd like you to pray with me. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, I call you Daddy. I said, I do not pray the Muslim prayer. I can only pray for you as a Christian. He said, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of Equa Church and I'm born again. I've been driving him for 10 years. This is the third or so uh, electoral process that I've driven him. I said, you are a Christian? He said, yes. I prayed with him. That was very shocking to me. Second thing that I received as a shocker, <laughs> a serious shock, we did the first uh, flag off in Kaduna. It was such a mammoth crowd. And if anyone would be pushed that day, there would be a serious stampede. And then after the flag all, we go to his home, and he's staggered. And he said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I said, excuse me, sir? 
Because I would have said, is that a swear word? And he looked at me and said, Pastor, you don't have monopoly of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, okay. I calmed down. I left it. Then we were in Abuja. And early morning, I was going to his uh, hotel apartment, presidential suite at Transcorp Hilton. And I met his bodyguards at the door. And one of them said, good morning, sir. A good morning, daddy. I said, why do you call me daddy? He said, you are a grandfather, actually, because our pastor is your son in the faith. We go to Lighthouse. And I said, what kind of a man is this? Never at once try to hinder uh, my faith or to try to say, to be irritated by me. And all around him, a cook and these and that were Christians. So how do you talk with Abuja if this is if Dara is noisy sometimes? No, Abuja, I'm effectively protected by security and COVID-19. You see? Uh, security wouldn't allow people to be seeing me in the same pool of COVID. So I am thanking the security and COVID. <laughs> Uh, where do you find the energy? You'll be 80 in December. Yes. You walked from the mosque today. Mm -hmm. You walked almost an hour now. So where do you find this energy? I mean, I'm younger and I'm tired. <laughs> yes. You, if you were a village man like me, you, I think you would have been stronger. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a crazy one that was going around at one time that you are not Buhari. Did you hear about that one? Yes, people said that I'm somebody from Sudan. They even still mentioned the name. I didn't bother. Nigerians, when they don't understand, think they create their own mysterious way of uh, explaining themselves. Does it help that you have your sense of humor to find those things funny? No, it's not funny because uh, those who are advocating or who are making those statements, they just want to be cheeky. They want to distract attention from the main issue. Our main issue is uh, do the infrastructure, uh, make people aware that uh, they need to work hard to live well. They just can't, uh, you know, enjoy life for, uh, without earning uh, the respect of their communities and so on. After you leave the presidency, yes. what are you going to miss the most about the presidency? I wonder if I'm going to miss much. I think I'm being harassed. I believe uh, myself that I'm trying my best, but still my best is not good enough because there are people around that uh, think that they can intimidate authorities to get what they want instead of going through establish systems, you know, and earn whatever they want to earn. There are still people who want to, who behave, uh, who are clever by half, let me put it that way. When I left secondary school, I came back here. This is my base. Who counter who, civil war, who counter who, detention. I have gone through it all. I have tried hard enough. I think I have tried hard enough. The results are obvious, and uh, uh, I'm praying very hard that uh, I will end up well.
Opinions are free. Facts are sacred. The truth is universal. How, in practical terms, can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? The president must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On Digi360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts, and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, the future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go- any governor to look for grant for ranching. Digi360, dissecting the issues. Top of the morning to you, Nigeria, and welcome to What's Your Take? My name is Dayo Akintobi, and I'll be taking you through all the big stories that made the headlines last week. Well, this has been a glorious week um, and a glorious month, a couple of months in Nigeria's history. The elections have come and gone. They are done and dusted. We can relax and breathe again at long last. As you know, the governorship elections held uh, this last Saturday. Uh, the winners, some winners have been declared and some losers are busy um, taking in their loss. As we speak this morning, some are experiencing the thrill of victory and others are suffering the agony of defeat. That's what politics is about. You win some, you lose some. In any political contest, there will be a winner and there will be a loser. However, there have been some firsts in this election that goes to show that our democratic process is deepening and it is progressing. For the first time, uh, we've almost had a female governor. As of this time yesterday, it looked like the APC candidate for Adamawa, a female, was actually going to be our first elected female. However, the news coming out this morning seems to show that uh, the PDP may have taken that state. Nonetheless, whether she gets there or she doesn't get there, she made an extremely good showing, which for the fact that it is even a state in the north that is predominantly a patriarchal society, it is a very good development for our democracy that she had such a good showing. In addition, we also have a reverend for the first time in Benue State, which is a predominantly Muslim state, a Christian reverend has become the governor-elect in Benue State. That is progress. It goes to show that religion is not the primary criteria by which voters now make their voting decisions. And then back in the south, we have what we call the happy hour governor in Akwa Ibom State, which <laughs> has been a joke all through this last week because the PDP candidate in the run-up to the election promised that if he were elected, he would make sure that every Friday uh, drinks be sold at cut rate price prices all through Akwa Ibom State. Yet today, my newscaster, are we moving our studio to Akwa Ibom State <laughs> from next month? I think we are we should. recording this show from there so we can get cheap and free drinks? What considering do you think? It. I'm, I'm actually considering that. You're actually considering that. Well, mm-hmm. we'll pack up this studio and move right along with you. How have you been and how was your weekend? Did you uh, vote? Uh, how was your voting experience? My weekend has been well. My voting experience as well was very smooth and very easy. It took less than five minutes, just as the last presidential elections. Um, I wouldn't say it was the same for other areas because my friends that stay in VGC, they came, woke up as early as 8 a.m., went to the polling units, and they were told three hours after waiting to come back the next day, which was a Sunday, and they spent their whole days there before they were able to vote. So... That's yeah. what I have to say about Yes, it. yes. We have reports of isolated and sporadic incidents of uh, violence, of uh, uh, irregularities, mm. of uh, INEC shortcomings. So we can't say the election was perfect. We can't say it was seamless. But at least we've got it done. Winners are starting to be declared. And Nigeria will move on 
and we will heal from all of the division, the hate speech, um, mm -hmm. the divisiveness, the rancor. We'll pick ourselves up and move on. And hopefully all the new people who will take office May 29 will do their very best to improve the lot of the masses in Nigeria. Now, having said that, um, before we introduce our guests, uh, there's another interesting story we should talk, touch on briefly. And this is how the people in the city of Shagamu, Ogun State, have found themselves having to travel to Ikorodu and in some cases Ijebode to go and uh, queue for cash because in their wisdom, they burnt down all the banks in Shagamu in protest <laughs> of the Naira scarcity. So who is now paying the price for those burnt banks? They are traveling to Ikorodu. And guess what? When they go to Ikorodu on Friday, the Ikorodu people say, welcome. We're happy you're here, but go to the back. <laughs> You will not collect money before us Ikorodu people go to the back of the queue. So please let us think about the fallout of the things we do before we do them. You burn the bank and it's to your own detriment. So now you don't have anywhere to collect cash in Shagamu. You're not having to go all the way to Ikorodu and then go and take your place in the back of the line behind the indigents who got there before you. All right. So that was just a lighter look at some of the things that happened. Let's get into the more substantive issues. Joining me to take a look at the big stories that made the headlines last week is Kolade Stephen Adeni, popularly known as Coach K. Coach K is an experiential learning coach. Wow, that sounds like a very big title. Experiential learning coach <laughs> who is the MD of 361 Degrees Limited, where he functions as a performance improvement and life coach, as well as a business psychologist. Welcome to What's Your Take, Coach K. Thank you for joining us. Thank this you. Morning. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for um, letting me be here. Uh, I think I like your warm, your warm start on the entire news about the Shagamu people burning their banks. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's just very interesting. Um, I know we are yet to get into the art of the conversation, but I think it's a good place to start from, mm -hmm. which is that um, it's easy for you to be, um, to, to be a party of, to the bandwagon effect or find yourself being lost in the concept of the ed, ed, ed mentality. Yes. And you just follow the ed. Um, and at that level, emotions are, are rife. People yes. are not really thinking. Right. They're just going on with the energy that presents, that presents itself. And, yes. um, Even if it's a negative energy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. Like, which is, like I said, uh, one of the things I like to start with, and I think our viewers also should, should be mindful of, is the concept of um, what I call the E plus R formula equals O. And um, if we take that into cognizance, then our actions and our responses will be different because it simply states that your emotion plus your response equals your outcome. Wow, fantastic. We will bring you back here to come and teach us all about <laughs> experiential learning. <laughs> Meanwhile, over to you yesterday to give us the very first big story of last week so we can talk about this. Governorship elections. Incumbents keep grip on power in battleground states as INEC begin declaring results. Violence, thuggery, and voter intimidation mar polls in some states. Governors Makinde, Somwolu, Abiodu, Yahaya, Abdul Rasak, Zulum, Buni, others win second term. Over to you, Dayo. All right. Okay, Coach K. Well, um, I don't know what your take is on the entire general elections from the presidential three weeks ago to the governorship yesterday. But as I said in my opening monologue, bottom line is the elections are done and dusted. Done and dusted. We have a new crop of leaders, although mm -hmm. the results are still being announced yeah. from the governorship one. But we have a new crop of leaders. What would you like to see from the new people who take power in May 29th compared to those who are going out now? What, what, do you, what are your expectations of our new crop of leaders? Um, without thinking, I think this one is a no-brainer. So I think the missing nexus between leadership and the people is accountability. I think that's one thing that was deeply missing for the outgoing executives, either at the state level as governors or vis-a-vis uh, -vis even the president. Um, I think there was a lot of lack of accountability. Um, and I think if you look at human nature in itself, with regards to people, you find out that the lack of people being accountable for what you promise to do, uh, what you deliver, and the fact that even when you do things out of what you promise, 
you see the need for you to tell people that um, these are the reasons for this action and this is how it will impact. Um, case in point, case in point, the Lagos gubernatorial race, which became interesting between the incumbent and, of course, the um, the out of the blue candidate who gave mm. us another three leg three leg horse race in Lagos. Yes, Labour Party, uh, Labour Party contestant. Can, contestant. And then you would suddenly realize that it became an issue more because the same governor that didn't show that could not, and I'm picking my words carefully, that could not show up for the debates for the um, gubernatorial debate across across the state suddenly found out that in, in two weeks he needed to be accountable all of a sudden. And then which also now brings to fore the conversation that if you've done your job so well, then you don't need to explain to people that uh, your job was well done. They will see. They will they know. Should see. They should know. It they should, should be automatic. See. So which of course now also now brings to bear the fact that the people who are the minders, the media minders of the governor, apparently should be um, should step up their game and then they should be held responsible because if the governor has done so much how come that the narrative is not directly impacted on the people um we of course i grew up of course you'll be very familiar that we grew up with the mamsa with, with the with the mamsa logo where we knew that it was mass mobilization people were heavily sensitized. So, and I think also that is another thing we're still talking about accountability, accountability that the current government or the incoming government must make very, very, must make um, an imperative. Otherwise, we find ourselves going back to the conversation of, oh, you're Imo, I'm Yoruba, oh, you're Aousa, oh, no, you're Kanuri. The and those labels shouldn't count. Or they don't, should, don't they shouldn't count. count. They shouldn't count because... Um, when you are born, you are born, like we said earlier when we were speaking at the lobby, you are born a human being first. You are born a person. And then the moment when you went to primary school, uh, secondary school, you were not worried whether the person to your right was, was an Ahmed or the lady sitting in front of you was was a Choma. No, it wasn't what my... And Rivers APC accuses Governor Yeson Wike of sponsoring electoral violence. Glad to have you join us on News Now. I am Mary Kanu. We begin the news with the latest development in Oshun State as the Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja has set aside the decision of the Oshun State Governorship Tribunal and has upheld the election of Ademola Adeleke as the governor of the state. Following the governorship polls in the state, an election petition tribunal had sacked Adeleke from office, saying that the People's Democratic Party candidate did not score a majority of lawful votes during the July 16 governorship polls. However, in a unanimous agreement by a three-man panel led by Justice Mohammed Shwaibul, the Court of Appeal quashed the tribunal's judgment, gave its verdict to uphold Adeleke as the rightful governor of Oshun State. Well, there are so many issues involved uh, in this appeal. Some of the issues were won. Some of uh, a bit more of the issues were lost. Overall, we lost the appeal. But they are so, it's so interesting. We believe that as soon as we collect the various judgments, which are all um, more or less the same, by Monday we would uh, study the judgment and then make our decision. But it's, it's most likely because of the very interesting nature 
of the decisions made that the matter will not end here. The PDP as a political party won its appeal. Yep. INEC as an appellant before this court of appeal won the appeal. Won the appeal. Uh, so the totality of the appeal presented before the court of appeal here in have succeeded and the court has affirmed that Senator Ademola Adeleke remains the governor of Osun State. We are, we are happy today that eventually we are able to get justice. We have always believed that the justice given by the lower court is best described as a judicial abortion. What this means is justice, judicial miscarriage. Um, the, the, the judgment today is in conformity with the expectation of our people. It has really confirmed that our governor, His Excellency, Governor Adibor Adeke, actually and really won the July 16 election. I mean, the judgment today manifests not only justice, but the scholastic content of the judgment is certainly going to be defying because certainly the legal profession is richer for the judgment delivered today. The innovative and revolutionary provisions of the Electoral Act has, have received judicial adjudication today by the judgment as delivered today. The ruling by the Court of Appeal reinstating Ademola Deleke as governor of Oshun State has been generating various reactions with legal experts and political analysts hailing the court's move as the right decision, calling on Adeleke to go to the Supreme Court for final judgment on the ruling. Legal expert Liberal Soshoma, who spoke in an interview with TV360 Nigeria, said the inconsistencies with the Court of Appeal's ruling in various judgments cannot be overlooked. What's left for um, Adeleke is if he wants to see pursue the matter, he should go to the Supreme Court. If you remember, um, the Court of Appeal, what's one of the reasons why election petition in governorship election was even, you know, taken to the Supreme Court is inconsistent, uh, consistent judgment coming from the Court of Appeal. Unlike before now, this would have been the end of the matter. Um, in Wike's case, uh, Wike got it um, at the tribe. Was sacked, no, was given judgment at the tribunal, Court of Appeal sacked him, and then um, the Supreme Court um, eventually, you know, reinstated him. Um, for Governor Mackinde of your state, I think uh, he, he was um, um, at least also the same way. He was, um, he got judgment at the tribunal, the Court of Appeal sacked him, and it was at the uh, Supreme Court that you know, he eventually won. So he can still go either way, depending on how the Supreme Court will eventually look at it. So I think um, the Yetola people would, might eventually, you know, want to try their luck at the Supreme Court. But one very instructive thing, very funny, is the fact that the team representing the Yetola at the tribunal, what they are requesting, you know, would be the opposite of what they will be defending at the presidential election. You know, it's almost the same thing at the presidential election panel, why the team that is representing, um, uh, what do you call it, Adeleke, you know, would be representing Labour at the tribunal and would be defending the opposite of what they are requesting for. But it's an interesting time and we'll see how that would pan out. While well, still in legal matters, the Presidential Election Tribunal has ordered that President-elect Bola Tunubu be served with copies of petitions seeking to nullify his election through substituted means. Ruling on separate ex parte motions filed by Peter Obi, candidate of the Liberal Party, and Atiku Abubakar, candidate of the People's Democratic Party, a three man panel of the court led by Joseph Igie directed that the petitions should be served on Tunubu through his political party, the All Progressives Congress. Both Atiku and Obi have asserted that the president elect is deliberately avoiding the service of their petitions and him. The panel equally granted leave to the Allied People's Movement to also serve its own petition on Tinubu through substituted means. And rising from the March 18 governorship and State House of Assembly elections, the All Progressives Congress in Rivers State has accused the Independent National Electric Commission, INEC, and security agencies of conniving with Governor Yusum Wike to rig the elections in the state. At a press briefing in Port Harcourt, APC spokesman in River State, Dalentin Umoju, said last Saturday's governorship and state assembly election were characterized by widespread violence which led to loss of lives. 
while Juliet, the four APC members were killed in Ahuada West local government area, with two persons still missing. Audrey also questioned the police on why it was yet to commission an investigation into all the killings that took place in the state, with a view to bringing the perpetrators to book and maintain that the party's governorship candidate, Tonye Cole, will soon approach the court to claim his stolen mandates. While still in electoral matters, an independent monitoring group under the aegis of Forum of Election Observers Groups have said that the outcome of the governorship and state house of assembly elections in Ogun State largely reflect the opinion of the vast majority of residents in line with the assessment of various stakeholders, including local observers. Coordinator of the group Ayodeji Ologun, who made the statement at a media briefing in Nikaja, Lagos, expressed a vote of confidence in the Independent National Electric Commission over the conduct and eventual results of the polls. Ologun stressed that the clarification became necessary considering a series of reports and agitations so far generated by the outcome of last Saturday's elections. This report become very important considering a series of reports and agitations so far generated by the outcome of the last Saturday's, of the last Saturday's election. A negative report being attributed to it by some politically exposed interests. Our failures organization, for instance, had observers deployed to observe the governorship of national election in Ogo State. Our findings revealed that certain lapses and reports of mafiosis that impacted on the quality of the process as a polling unit in the state, and that nonetheless were insignificant compared to the progress made during the election. That the outcome of the governorship election in Ogo State largely reflects the opinion of the vast majority of Ogo State people and very much in line with the assessment of various stakeholders, including local and international observers who witnessed the election. Finally, we wish to state that every Democrat who are committed to the advancement of our democracy must discourage every attempt by politicians and political parties to report self to report to self-help. We encourage every aggrieved individuals and parties to explore the legal opportunities available in seeking redress rather than encouraging any form of action that seeks to undermine our democracy and destabilize our peaceful coexistence as a people. At least 201 kidnapped victims have been rescued in the last two weeks in various military operations in Brno and Kaduna states. The Director of Defence Media Operations, Major General Musa Damadami, made the disclosure during the bi-weekly briefing at the Defence Headquarters. Damadami added that troops of Operation Wellstroke neutralised 14 terrorists, arrested 12 terrorist logistics suppliers and rescued 16 abducted civilians. On 14th March 2023, troops conducted clearance operations to terrorist enclave within Ngala local government area of Burnu State. During the operation, troops made contact with Boko Haram and Islamic State of West African Province terrorists, and following the firefight, six terrorists were neutralized. Troops exploited general area and recovered three AK-47 rifles, 10 den guns, 12 dummy rifles, 118 rounds of 7.62 mm by 50 mm NATO ammunition, 10 rounds of 7.62 mm by 54 mm NATO ammunition, 1 round of 12.7 mm NATO ammunition, 41 livestock, 2 mobile phones, and the sum of 4,000 naira only. Troops also rescued 49 kidnapped civilians, comprising of 26 adults and 23 children. Additionally, between 15 and 22 March 2023, troops on fighting patrol to Boko Haram and Islamic State of West African Province enslaved at villages within Biu, Goza and Bama local government areas of Borno State had an encounter with terrorists. Following a fierce firefight, troops neutralized seven terrorists and arrested five. Troops exploited these various locations and recovered four AK-47 rifle, seven AK-47 magazine, one 60mm mortar bomb, one firing pin, 102 rounds of 7.62mm special ammunition, two donkey, 10 mobile phone, 10 sachets of Anzol tablet, 
199 Sachet or Tramadol tablets and the sum of 4,317 Naira only, as well as rescued 46, 64 kidnapped victims. The Economic Community of West African State ECOWAS Parliament has attributed the poor access to reliable, sustainable and affordable energy in the region to the challenges of insecurity and lack of funding. The Speaker, Sidi Tunis, disclosed this at a five-day joint parliamentary committee in Freetown, Sierra Leone, with the theme, Building the Regional Energy Market for a Just Energy Transition. Tunis decried the awful lot of about 180 million West Africans subjected to poor distribution capacity and called for a joint effort by member nations in providing sustainable solutions to the challenges. If you look at the past 20 years, in the year 2000, our electricity access was just about 35%. And if you look at the electricity access in 2020, you will see that we have reached 60% access. It means it's taking us 20 years to double our electricity access. And if you look at this increase, if you compare it with other parts of the world, our progress was very slow. Again, if you look at the access that we have achieved, what you realize is that Majority of these access are centralized in urban centers. So if you look at most of the um, ECOWAS member countries, only three ECOWAS member states, that is Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Cape Verde, have been able to achieve over 50% electricity access in their rural communities. So overall, about 163 million people in West Africa do not have access to electricity. The Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SAREP, says it has sensitized over 11 million vulnerable Lagos residents in its quest to create awareness on the state's social protection policy, giving details of its two-day review meeting on the effective mechanism for promoting accountability for social protection policy. The group urged the government to do more in delivering benefits of the policy to the people. A correspondent, Sidney Okafo, has more details in this next report. In March 2022, the Lagos State Government unveiled its social protection policy. The aim of the policy, according to the government, was to provide succor to the poor and vulnerable in the state. But roughly a year after, a human rights group, Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, says the policy has not met its desired target. Speaking at the meeting to review the effective mechanism for promoting accountability for social protection in Lagos State. The group says it was able to reach over 11 million residents in its sensitization drive. We have reached over 11 million people in the state um, as a result of our little campaign. And um, there was even a time that we were getting more than 60 calls a day, but at a time it kind of um, it reduced to 20 10 calls after the radio campaign programs we still receive calls from time to time asking us for information about how to access the social uh, protection implementation in the state in its review the group also raised concern about reports of residents denied access to benefits of the social protection policy they however assure that justice will be delivered to the people when they go to Alausa and they are turned down, we expect that they feed us back and then we can explore other measures to see that we hold them accountable. So usually when we get feedback, we call the, the um, implementing MDAs to see that they do what is right as far as this is concerned. For Tolani Ojuri, the state chairman of Abenism Association of Nigeria, the lack of awareness on numerous programs established by the state government for people living with albinism is the major challenge. We were able to identify the gaps that yes, the government is doing some programs in which these vulnerable citizens, um, the ones that concern me, are persons with disability, which um, a major focus on persons with albinism. And we realized that there were some gaps, that the government was doing a lot of programs that people were not aware of. And we brought that to the fore. And that's, to a very large extent, all these gaps were closed. It's been three years since the outbreak of COVID-19 virus, which put a strain on the social economic well-being of millions of Nigerians. 
initiatives such as social protection policy aims to combat poverty and deprivation at all levels in this society. Sydney Okafor reporting for TV360 Nigeria. We'll take a break here, but still to come, CBN begins massive evacuation of banknotes to commercial banks. We'll bring you details of the story and more rights after this break. are free, facts are sacred, but truth is universal. How in practical terms can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. A new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for any governor to look for grant for ranching. DG360, dissecting the issues. Welcome back. Here's a recap of our top stories tonight. The Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja has set aside the decision of the Oshun State Governorship Tribunal and has upheld the election of Senator Adimola Deleke as the governor of the state. The appeal court panel revoked the tribunal's order which directed that the certificate of return be withdrawn from Adeleke and issued to his predecessor, an All Progressives Congress candidate, Boyega Wigitola. We also told you that the Presidential Election Tribunal has ordered that President-elect Bola Tinubu be served with copies of petitions seeking to nullify his election through substituted means. Ruling on separate ex-party motions filed by Peter Obi, the candidate of the Labour Party, and Atiku Abubakar, candidate of the People's Democratic Party, a three-man panel of the court led by Joseph Ikie directed that the petitions should be served on Tinubu through his political party, the All Progressives Congress. Well, in case you missed any of the news bulletin or for more updates, you can catch us on Line Maxwell TV or log on to our website on www.tv360nigeria.com. You can also follow us on our social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at TV360Nigeria. On Facebook, we're at TV360Online. And now to COVID-19 stories and updates, President Joe Biden's order that federal employees get vaccinated against COVID-19 has been blocked by a federal appeals court. The Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans rejected arguments that Biden, as the nation's chief executive, has the same authority as the CEO of a private corporation to require that employees be vaccinated. The ruling from the full appeals court, 16 full-time judges at the time the case was argued, reversed an earlier ruling by a three-judge Fifth Circuit panel that had upheld the vaccination requirement. We'll go on a break and return with business updates, so stay with us. Hello. Hello, Haji. Hello, Haji. Is it, right now I'm in Abuja. <laughs> no, no. Uh... Hello? Adamu.
Right now I'm in Kano. Yes. When I get back, I will just call you. Look, what is wrong with you? I'm talking on the phone and you are gesticulating and doing. What's wrong with you? Daddy, where exactly are we as we speak? Are you alright? This is Lagos. Well, you just lied to someone that we are in Abuja. Keep quiet. Eh? Who told you you can tell an elderly person is lying? Daddy, you just lied. And by lying, you are raising corrupt children for the future of Nigeria. That is corruption, not in my country. Corruption, not in my country. Welcome back. It's time for business news and stock market reports with Fola Shadio. Going day. Fola Shadi, over to you. Well, many thanks, Mary. And in business, as part of efforts to tackle the worsening Nara crisis, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has confirmed the evacuation of banknotes from its vaults to commercial banks across the country as part of a coordinated effort to ease the circulation of banknotes of various denominations. The CBN has also directed all commercial banks to open for operation on Saturdays and Sundays. According to a statement by the Acting Director of Corporate Communications Department of the CBN, Issa Abdul Mumin, the CBN has also directed all banks to load their automated teller machines, ATMs, as well as conduct physical operations in the banking halls through the weekends. National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, has said that Nigerians had missed enormous infrastructure development due to the protracted fuel subsidy regime in the country. Speaking on Thursday, Lawa Musa, a senior business advisor to Melikiari, Group Chief Executive Officer of NNPC Limited, uh, said the federal government spent as much as 4.8 trillion naira annually on petrol subsidy at the expense of the well-being of Nigerians. According to Musa, deregulation of petrol can deliver up to 500,000 new houses, provide additional 27,000 megawatts of electricity to Nigerians, and also educate and skill up to 2 million students at all levels. We'll take a break now and return with a review of the stock market. Just stay with us. Market's performance took a bearish trend at the end of the last week day of trading on the Niger Stock Exchange, leaving the All Share Index at 0.06%, and market capitalization at the 29.9 trillion Naira MAC. Now, the market breadth, however, ended positive with 13 gainers and 11 losers. Now, speaking of losers, ICO Insurance came out last with an end of day price appreciation of 5% at 57 cover per share, followed by WAPIC Insurance. Now the gainers chart, MPF Microfinance Bank led the gainers with 6.94% share price appreciation, closing at 1 Naira 85 cover per share, followed by Garigou Power. Now the end of trading today, a total of 137 million volume of shares valued at 3.8 billion Naira, exchange hands in 2,912 deals. Now away from the NGX to our select global stocks, FTSE, Dow Jones and Nikkei are all in the reds. I mean, take a look at this table. You can see that FTSE ended in the reds at 1.34%, uh, Dow Jones at 0.25%, and Nikkei Asian stocks ended also in the reds at 0.13%. Now for London stock FTSE, it was dragged by energy shares that tracked oil prices lower, while banks extended deadlines at the end of a turbulent week as fears of a global banking crisis lingered. And that's it on Business News and Stock Markets Review. Back to you, Mary, for the rest of the news. Thank you for the update, Falashadi. Now on the global scene, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky has said delays in sending fighter jets and long-range missiles could extend the war after he paid a visit to the frontline southern region of Kherson. Speaking on a train to Kyiv after his third visit in two days to war-ravaged areas near the front lines in the south and east of Ukraine, Zelensky gave an emotional account of what he had seen as he addressed the summit of European Union leaders guarded in Brussels via video link. While he welcomed a recent EU plan to send Kyiv one million artillery shells, he kept up his demands for warplanes and missiles that he believes will be more effective at pushing back Russian forces. 
Well, it's time for Entertainment Report. Popular international Afrobeat musician Davido has announced the release of his highly anticipated album. Davido has been off the music scene and social media for months after the tragic loss of his only son, Ifain, which led to him deleting several pictures and videos from his social media accounts. The singer returned with a video announcing his new project titled Timeless. The album, which would be his first studio album, will be released on 31st of March. Nigerian Nollywood actress Anne Injemanze has served the popular filmmaker Zeb Ejiro along with Film One Entertainment and Film Tribe Media with a sum of 50 million naira lawsuit for copyright infringement of Domitila the Reboot. This announcement, however, came after she played a titular character in the remaking of the movie on September 16, 2020, years after her rise to fame after playing the same character in 1996. Ejiro has, however, reacted by serving the actress with a counter suit for 500 million naira. In a statement of defense filed by his lawyers, the filmmaker described a lawsuit as a gold digging exercise. That's all on the entertainment segment of News Now. And now in sports, Guinea-Bissau has stunned the Super Eagles of Nigeria by a lone goal in a 2023 Africa Cup of Nations qualifier at the Moshud Abiola National Stadium in Abuja. A 29th-minute goal was all the visitors needed to shock the 2013 African winners on home soil and hand them a famous victory. With two previous wins from two matches, the Eagles were looking to stretch their lead in Group A. The second leg of the match between both teams is scheduled for March 27 at the Estadio 24 in Bissau. And that's the size of a news bulletin. Thank you for watching. I am Mary Kanu. How, in practical terms, can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts, and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. A new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. DG360, dissecting the issues. Hello and welcome to another edition of What's Your Take? I am Dayo Akintobi, 
And it's a pleasure to be with you here again this glorious Monday morning. And how has your week been? This has been a very interesting week uh, on the landscape of Nigeria, especially to do with politics. We saw, uh, first of all, the postponement of the governorship elections by one week by the electoral umpire. We'll talk about that. It's good to have you join me on the program. I am Mary Kanu. As expected, negative reactions have trailed the decision by the Central Bank of Nigeria to increase its interest rate by 18%. This comes amid the lingering currency crisis and a fragile economy. The latest decision by the CBN shows that the Monetary Policy Committee had raised its monetary policy rate twice in 2023. According to the CBN Governor Godwin Mayfile, the decision was reached as part of the measure to stem rising inflation, which jumped to 21.91% in February. The MPC retained other parameters such as the cash reserve ratio at 32% while liquidity was also kept at 30%. Although the CBN governor has said the move was to further tame inflation, economy experts say on the contrary it will not as previous increases did not yield the desired outcome. Many experts also say the new rate will have a counter effect on businesses and by extension the economy and that an increased interest rate would also lead to a price increase because manufacturers and investors would pass the burden of the high cost of a loan to the consumers of their goods and services. But then how serious is this increase? Financial analyst Lloyd Onyeke joins me on the program. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, this decision by the CBN was not expected, you know, and somehow it has generated outcry from Nigerians. What was your reaction to it? And uh, do you think raising the interest rate was done in the best interest of Nigerians? Um, thank you very much for uh, bringing me to the program. Uh, my feelings uh, based on uh, the trend so far, um, this administration is that uh, the effect will be lost on, on Nigeria in real time. Uh, if you look at uh, the history of uh, the NPR adjustment in Nigeria, uh, you'll recall that uh, it wasn't too long ago in January, uh, the CBN increased the NPR rate uh, by 100 uh, points basis from 15.5 to 17.5. The argument uh, Posited then by CBN was that it was going to strengthen the economy, tame inflation, you know, amongst other things. And the question is. Um, uh, uh, if you can hear me, can you please speak up? It's quite difficult to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's better. Go on, please. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, all you need to do is check the increase that was done the last time the Committee on Monetary uh, Policy 
met at the CBN uh, to, to weigh the movement, the trend, uh, if there was any progress made at all in terms of the economic index. And there's not really support the argument that uh, Nigerians are going to see uh, the, the concerns of the CBN justified. There's no justification. So when it was moved to 17.5%, from then on till now, there's been no significant improvement in the economy. Nothing, not in the employment rate, not in inflationary uh, indices, not in even commodity. There's nothing in the economy that has actually shown that the CBN is right in increasing the monetary uh, policy rate. Now, I want you to please give us uh, or paint a clearer picture, you know, of how much an impact this increase will have on businesses and uh, the economy at large. All right. So um, the first thing you're going to do that is what are these rates for? Or shall we say, what is this rate adjustment meant to do in the economy? So what it does, is that through the MPR rate that the CBN forms or presents to the financial sector, banks, uh, deposit money banks, and other banks, uh, commercial banks specifically, are able to tailor their interest rate around the, the guidance of the CBN. So at presently 18% uh, interest rate, the question will be how much will banks, are uh, banks like to lend out, how much are banks likely to pay, you know, for, for, for transactions, especially regarding interest. Chances are that I can, I can assure you by practice, it can be less than 18 to 18 percent, which, which CBN itself has said. So what, what we're going to have is that we have rates that would grow beyond what the CBN benchmark. And the consequence of it, the implication of it is that there's going to be positive of funds. Banks are not going to be ready to lend out money at a rate that would be amenable for business. Uh, so you're going to have 21, 22% interest rate going upward that way. So what it means for business, for the manufacturing sector, for um, other aspects of the economy, is that funds will not be within the reach of, of businesses. And the backlash would be that at the end of the day, the economy will not grow because when an economy is awash with funds to, to a large extent, it means that people are able to lay in funds to produce, to import. You know, we, we don't even want to talk about the issue of the exchange rate that by the policies of the CBN has made funds for businesses, especially uh, international businesses, to be difficult to reach. Of course, we know what happened last year and even the year before, where even up till this moment as we speak, foreign exchange is a very rare uh, venture to go into. So that importers and those who do international transactions are unable to lay hands on, on the dollar. You know, so the implication of this is that even for internal borrowers, those who want to access funds to rejig their businesses, to hedge, you know, or to do all that sorts of financial uh, transactions, these funds will not be readily available for them. Banks will never reduce their rates below what the CBN said. Now, we've seen some economic analysts and, you know, economic experts and analysts who say they believe that the CBN's reference to the inflation rate being higher than the rate of the MPR was just a policy misconception. What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, to start with, um, I don't think the CBN, in all, in all fairness, we have um, experts uh, who work at the CBN who, uh, who, uh, who dish out policies, who formulate these policies that the economy runs on. But I think that um, with due respect to them, their intelligence, uh, we will talk about the will of government to do what is right by Nigeria. So it's one thing for the CBN to argue that there's a disparity between uh, the, uh, the inflation rate and also the MPR rate, which uh, they have presented 
But the real issue is paying lip service to uh, just show emotion of of activities. That's what I. That's what some analysts have said um, that the CBN knows where the problem is, knows what to tackle, and has refused to do it. So, if you want to tame inflation rate, if you want to argue that there's a wide gap between uh, what you've set as mon monetary policy and what the inflation rate. The CBN actually knows what to do. For example, it's my view that the CBN can actually reduce monetary policy rate for once, and then let's watch what's going to happen. I can tell you that that gap that they have complained about is likely to be reversed. All right, now, um, for, for the private sector, we've seen some industry watches. Um, they, they say they do not see rate hike as a good development for the private sector. So I must ask you how you think this, um, the high lending rate will affect businesses in the country? Well, really, uh, like I said before, it's going to have an adverse effect. And just a while ago, I mentioned that, um, that the CBN should have actually tried to reduce this rate rather than increase it. Uh, when you continue to do a particular thing for a long time, and you don't get the, the desired result or the expected result. Chances are that you want to say, um, let's try the opposite. So now, uh, the spending attitude of Nigeria and of business uh, is being stymied. And, and I use that word carefully. It's being killed uh, because businesses are unable to meet the obligation even when uh, 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 the private sector, uh, those who play in the private sector, borrow funds from banks and from other financial institutions because of the effect of the economy, because of the adverse effect of the economy, they are unable to meet the obligation. They are unable to repay as when they should do. So for, for the private sector, it is, it is a turn off. Let me use that word. It, 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 this policy lacks in incentives uh, to grow the economy. It doesn't encourage borrowers to want to borrow. Because if you're a smart businessman, you're going to ask yourself, at this rate, what are the chances, given the fact that there's epileptic power supply, given the fact that you know, your road network is like a trucker, you know, isn't there to complement your effort, given that uh, even there are a lot of other schools, economic issues, if you are in the manufacturing, well, uh, construction, engineering sector, you go to a site, you want to uh, begin work, you have the, the, the minas of the auction, the area boys, you know, the agbaros come in to say, look, before you do any sort of work here, you're going to pay X and X and X amount of money. This wasn't factored in, in your buildup of, you know, cost. Uh, you, and so it upsets the apple cart for you. So all of these socioeconomic issues, you know, are there to make the, the borrower of funds to see that with the increase, the constant increase, the constant tinkering with this uh, price index, you know, it bodes an, a wrong omen, you know, doesn't create that avenue for businesses to thrive. So the private sector, it's on the receiving end of this. And in, in the end, uh, chances are that, and I can tell you, I can almost bet that, um, uh, except that Nigerians have this general uh, outlook of, shall I say, you know, using the word suffering and smiling. People get out in the morning, you know, they show motions of activity, you know, whatever comes in at the end of the day uh, is what they go home with. Uh, there are no projections. There are no assurances. You know, so Nigerians may be able to uh, plod on, move on, but in the end, when the chips are down and you put pen on paper and do an analysis of the entire thing, the private sector is going to be worse off for it. All right, now, financial analyst Lloyd Onyeke, thank you very much for your time and your contribution. Thank you. All right, now let's take a break now, but when we return, the program will continue to stay with us.
Welcome back. The just concluded general elections no doubt came with its different dynamics. It was a shift from the old order when four prominent candidates contested for the nation's topmost position as the fifth democratically elected president, as opposed to the regular two-horse race of previous elections. The tenacity of Nigerians was further tested when the Independent National Electric Commission, INEC, the country's electoral umpire, insisted that the elections will be held just by the fuel and cash scarcity crisis. Citizens defied the odds and came out in mass to vote for the preferred candidates. Many had acclaimed the elections to be a game of numbers, and this was partly evident in the percentage of youths that registered to vote in the elections. Now, electoral violence has always been a regular feature in Nigeria. The 2023 elections were no different, as it was fraught with violence despite promises by the federal government to curb violence. Now, according to the Center for Democracy and Development, Nigeria recorded 109 deaths in three months linked to the 2023 elections. Although some say the elections were free, fair and credible. Many disagree with the notion. For more insights into how the elections went, I'm now joined by Chairman Ethnocopia Limited, Adewale Ajadi. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, it's been one week or less than a week after the governorship elections and uh, uh, various reactions still thrilled the just-concluded elections. So, let's start by knowing your thoughts. Are you impressed by INEX conduct of the elections, you know, compared with previous elections we've had in the country? Well, it is, for any fair-minded person, this is quite an improvement. Oh. And what are the improvements I'm talking about? The BVAS itself is a large improvement on past election. Let's be clear, when people criticize Nigerian elections, at least this last elections, it's because they expect zero defects. And in a country of nearly 200 million people with over 250 different ethnic groups, with, with almost a split on religious lines, this is often what is a winner-takes-all system. And until our system is more participatory, rather than the last problem. So this is not INEX's problem. The fact that there are violence leading to the election is not INEC's problem. It's our problem. It's our behavior. It's our choices. INEC had to ensure that everybody that voted was voting credibly. The beavers, um, in many observers' reflection, worked about 90 to 95% of the time. That's massive. Now, the thing that people are complaining about is the IREP, which is the uploading of results. The uploading of results does not denigrate the manual process that was utilized to affirm that the votes counted was signed off by the party agent. Once that signed off by the party agent as credible, collated in the states, then the uploading is a matter of technical issue. Now, if you look at the difference between the presidential election and the governorship election, you can see that there's been an improvement. So these are certainly issues that we need to uh, understand and I, not I, denigrate time anymore. I, I know you say there is an improvement, uh, thanks to the Beavers, but uh, then again, the Beavers, you know, the elections were still mad by uh, technical glitches, which, you know, beclouded the authenticity of the results declared by INEC, and now aggrieved parties are in court. Do you think the Beavers' technology was even necessary in the first place? No, I think you are confusing two things. Mm. The Beavers is different from the IREP. They're two different things. The Beavers is what embodies the biometric details of the voter and is verified. That worked over 90% of the time. That wasn't the problem. The issue was how do you upload results? And let's look at the issue of uploading results. If you are uploading just the absolute numbers without taking pictures, then there's a different thing. And as we are speaking, for example, we have had many times we have been speaking, you have been interviewing me, and there's been a technical glitch. There are technical glitches. Our, our um, infrastructure for, for um, um, digital technology is not perfect, and we know that. You're asking in over two days, three days period for the massive infrastructure of, the, the, for the infrastructure of this country to carry more than what the banks try to, we try to do in our banking tra transactions and fail every day. Let's, be, let's, be, let's recognize what we're talking about. It's an enterprise-wide system that had flaws in it. And it has flaws in it because millions of people were also trying to get on at the same time. Now, if we look at the presidential election and compare it to the governorship election, the same thing was not repeated at the governorship election. Even in the presidential election that we are criticizing, 
85% of the results were uploaded by the fourth date. And usually the fourth date is usually when the presidential election is announced. All right, now, um, uh, there were video uploads and images on the internet on violence that took place first. You know, numerous cases reported nationwide. Now, this suddenly seems like a norm. So are you concerned by this trend? Well, uh, this is what I was, the point I was making. I'm not complacent. I'm not saying we can't improve on violence. But to be honest with you, we are people, especially our men, resolve our differences with conflict and violence. Look at it across our life. This is the behavior of Nigerians. You don't suddenly stop in that behavior because you have an election. In actual fact, there's greater likelihood in a winner-takes-all system that this is what will happen when you have an election. The sociology of Nigerians, the problems that we have, don't suddenly disappear because we are electing ourselves. But as it improved compared to what it was, when ballots would be taken away completely in a city, and nobody can say anything. When people will write numbers that are more than the registered voters in a, in a, in a particular polling unit or in across a section of the city, we have moved immensely. And now let's compare it to what happens in other countries because sometimes we beat ourselves up as Nigerians. We're talking about 200 million people. The United States has many incidents of election malpractices. If you go and look at it, but it's never published because we don't look on the local level, we look on the national level. And when things bust out like we had after the elections, the last elections when people went to attack the, the, the Senate, you know, we take it as, a, as, 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 as something that is a, a, um, out of the ordinary. But this has been brewing and this has been happening in their system because it's also a winner-takes-all system. So let's be careful in saying, yes, there are things that we can improve and we must improve. But we are far away from where we are. And because people lose, they try to amplify the, the notion that every, nothing is working. You can't buy that, that, that lie. It's an absolute lie. Um, during the elections, they demonstrated their commitment to the democratic process. But, you know, even with the high anticipation, many voters were disenfranchised due to various irregularities. Do you see this affecting the turnout of voters in the country's next election? We're talking the next four years, you know, because some already feel their votes uh, did not count in this election. I don't know where you get that figure that people are disenfranchised. The people who are loud on the internet make sure that their voices are heard and they are disappointed that their candidate did not win. That is a fact. But that people are disenfranchised I think for most part, everybody that wanted to vote, voted. With the exceptions, there are exceptions to the rule. The exceptions in the South. Uh, uh, in the case the of the ballot box in, in the snatching, in, in the case of the ballot box snatching that we saw, the violence that we saw, clearly those people, their votes did not count. So they were disenfranchised. Well, I want you to count how many cases you are talking about. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have hundreds of thousands or millions of people that voted. I venture that you have less than a thousand people that you're talking about. And you cannot use the case of our thousand people to judge the millions of people that voted. It is, does not dismiss the fact that there are things that we can improve. We certainly can improve on things. But let's not exaggerate what the issues are. Let's look at what the issues are. Now let's talk about the issue of voter turnout, which is bad in Nigeria. And it is bad in Nigeria because we have focused on the wrong things in my view at least to the exclusion of what we should focus on. People focus on election voting rather than political participation. And because election voting is considered to be the totality of political vote participation, people get disappointed when they don't get what they want and they don't come back to vote. However, if you have a system where firstly it's not winner takes all, which means that people can participate on different levels, Secondly, the local government democracy is active and state government, local government is active. Oh, sorry, state government um, 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 democracy is active. Then you have a better situation because people can participate all year round and don't have to wait until elections because, before they feel that they are included in the system of government. But right now, we only have a system whereby people vote every four years. And if they don't vote in those four years, they wait until what government does and, and, and comment on it in newspapers and online. That has to change. 
All right, you know, clearly you've scored INEC high, but many may not agree with you. So I must ask you, where would you like to see improvements uh, in the next elections from INEC? Well, well, as far as INEC is concerned, firstly, you have to give credit to the drafters of the Electoral Act. Mm. They had the foresight to make sure that INEC is not tied to the IRF uploading alone. That is a massive saviour of the kinds of problems that we are facing right now. It's a massive um, improvement for us. Because if it had been that IREV would have been declared as the only way INEC could have uploaded, it would have been a major problem. So I thank God for that. The second thing that I think that INEC has to do is to make sure that its manual systems are robust enough and are transparent enough and that we're not dependent almost exclusively on electronic, electronic system. Because right now, the idea is that we treat technology like it's a silver bullet. It's never a silver bullet. Anybody that has been disappointed by technology knows in the kind of infrastructure that we have that that might happen and will happen on the big occasions. So we need to make sure that there is a system, that is a parallel system that is transparent and that engages people. Thirdly, there has to be massive voter education, mm -hmm. not large-scale voter education, but local vocal, um, lo uh, local voter education for people to understand the difference between things like the beavers, the IRF, what is expected in the law, so that they understand and they don't just get themselves excited over nothing. Because there's a lot of excitement over nothing. You know? And we are going to see the courts decide these matters over the next few weeks so that people understand how the law should work. What discretion INEC has. And remember this. It's very important that you remember this. We have a low trust society. We do not trust each other. We do not trust government. So anything that gives government the illusion, uh, people the illusion that government is not being transparent is considered to be corruption. It's considered to be manipulation. We need a lot more to educate people about what we are doing, why we are doing it, and why they should trust INEC. Well, all right now, Chairman Ethnocopia Limited at Dewali Ajadi. As always, thank you for your time and your contribution. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good day. Well, that's our program this week. Thank you for watching. I am Mary Kanu. Bye bye. There are many sad and dark events in human history, but none devastated the African continent like slavery. To understand some of the plight those who were sold into slavery went through, one must visit Gori Island, their last point of departure from the African continent. To the new world. Boarding the ferry to Gory Island. This is no slave ship, but it is no less built to capacity. But this time, with goods. Tourists, traders, and for a hint of Noah's Ark, some animals, even though there are not two of each kind. Slavery ended more than 153 years ago. One can't help but feel sadness 
just walking the streets, trying to imagine what went through the minds of these citizens of various countries. As they were hauled, sold, and shipped to a strange new world. Where did these slaves come from? At that time, each African ethnic group had its price. And the most expensive ethnic group used to be the Yoruba. 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 Yeah, they were from Nigeria. Because those Yoruba were very strong and tall. And they worked very hard in the plantations. That's why they were more expensive. They took those kids for two reasons. First, because in the plantations in America, there were some special jobs, typically for the kids, and they did them very well. And then because of most of those kids were from the parents very strong, because they saw that when they will grow up, they will be strong, like their parents. That's why they took them. In all the 28 slave houses in God Island, the slave masters have the right to sleep with the young girls. Once a young girl was pregnant, she became free here in God Island or in St. Louis, in North of Senegal. But she wasn't totally free because usually she worked as domestic slave in the European houses, you know. That's why some of the young girls found a kind of interest to be pregnant from white masters so they can be free. free. of a man was up to his weight and his master was So the minimum weight for men was 60 kilos. Those who have less than 60 kilos, they put them in this special cell just in order to fatten them up. Let me tell you that they did not buy slaves with money. It, it was a change. Mm -hmm. For example, to buy a man up to 60 kilos or a virgin girl, you could give a gun, a gun or a barrel of wine or a blanket 